Welcome everybody to this international gathering, this Infant Mental Health Awareness Week webinar um, across the nations today as we meet. Um, I first of all want to acknowledge uh, the custodians of the land of Australia, the island um, continent of Australia, the custodians of this land and seas, the peoples of the indigenous nations, their elders, past, present, future, and the emerging children who will be leaders in time to come. <clears throat> My name is Gally McKenzie. I'm the chairperson of the Australian Association for Infant Mental Health, a multidisciplinary, multicultural body representing many stakeholders and inclusive of many models of infant mental health work. We currently have seven branches with over 500 members on our island continent. Much gratitude to our infant mental health awareness subcommittee, which being chaired by Dr. Nicole Melbourne, who has developed and coordinated this collaborative undertaking with AIM UK, the Parent Infant Foundation UK, and with support from the World Association for Infant Mental Health. We are fortunate to have the new WAIM president, our Australian colleague, Associate Professor Campbell Paul with us today to chair this webinar. Congratulations, um, Campbell, on your new role. Campbell is an infant psychiatrist. He has had key roles in Melbourne Royal Children's Hospital and the University of Melbourne over decades. He, along with his colleagues, were the foundational members of the Australian Association for Infant Mental Health, and Campbell had passed member of the Association's Management Committee. I hand you over to Campbell now um, and invite you to join with us all as we hear from the speakers who we're very grateful for their presentations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Gally, for that uh, welcome. Um, and uh, uh, it's a great honour to be able to join um, with uh, the three organisations behind the uh, webinar this evening with the support of, uh, of WAIM, the World Association for Infant Mental Health. Um, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to have members from the Australian Association for Infant Mental Health, the uh, UK Association for Infant Mental Health, members from the Parent Infant Foundation, um, who are supporting that from the UK, and also um, people who will be registered or participating in the uh, WAIM Congress, um, which will be now in Brisbane in 2021. Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. And uh, in saying that, I too would like to give my um, 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 uh, acknowledgement of uh, Aboriginal people who have um, uh, cared for this country where uh, some of us are, are sitting and standing at the moment, um, but uh, who've, who've cared for and been the custodians of, uh, 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 of Australia over these um, millennia um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present um, in uh, each of the uh, areas of the country uh, where people are uh, currently sitting and listening and working and living. Um, it's also obviously a very um, uh, challenging time in the midst of the global pandemic of uh, COVID virus and that's going to be part of the uh, um, focus on, on uh, tonight, this morning, today's um, uh, webinar. Um, but uh, it's occurring in the context of uh, Infant Mental Health Awareness Week, which is uh, a, um, a focus on infant mental health uh, occurring around the world. And, uh, in particular, we've got contributions from the UK and from Australia here tonight. Um, I've just put up um, one of the infograms um, from um, the um, uh, Parent Infant Foundation from the UK and the First Thousand Days Movement. Uh, again, just emphasising how uh, we are in this um, together. This is a global uh, experience of infant mental health and, and, and at the moment a global experience of the uh, um, COVID-19 pandemic and its effects. Um, but uh, uh, maybe at this point I'll 
let you know who's going to be talking with us and you'll have already seen some of the information in the notices and flyers that have gone around. But uh, Gally as chair of the Australian Association uh, for Mental Health has um, welcomed us. Um, she said, I'm uh, an infant psychiatrist and uh, current just taken up the robes of president of the World Association. Now, our first speaker is um, uh, Sally Hogg, who is um, head of policy and planning um, at the um, uh, Parent Infant Foundation in the UK. Sally leads work there to raise awareness about the importance of early relationships to drive change at both national and local level. And this includes coordinating the first 1000 days movement. And uh, Kelly, um, sorry, Sally's been very active in uh, lobbying parliamentarians, all party parliamentary group that has been leading change within the UK. The first 1000 days move and one days movement uh, is an alliance of 140 organisations and that's no mean feat to uh, coordinate uh, a group such as that, all with a shared interest in babies' emotional and social development, working together to campaign for change. Sally's previous role included strategic lead at the Maternal Mental Health Alliance, senior commissioner in a local authority, and development manager for children under one in the NSBC in the UK. She developed and led uh, research interventions there. Sally started her career as a civil servant working on children's policy in the UK and uh, importantly in New South Wales as well. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers now and then we'll have a flow and we'll have time for uh, uh, questions uh, and feedback at the end, which you can do through the chat medium um, at the bottom of your um, uh, Zoom um, setup. So Sally is going to lead us and then Elizabeth is going to talk. Um, is actually, Sally's talk is Infant Mental Health Awareness Week. It's needed now more than ever. Elizabeth uh, Holm is a medical director, psychiatrist at the Queensland Centre for Perinatal and Infant Mental Health. This centre has delivered clinical and family support services to infants, young children, and their families across Brisbane and the Pine Rivers area. It's in Queensland. And this is an amazing. Uh, uh, service that uh, Elizabeth and her colleagues have developed. In addition to the clinical program, there is cross-sector support for the development of a statewide continuum of care for perinatal and infant mental health. Elizabeth's been more than 25 years experience in child and youth mental health, clinical service delivery, service management, development, quality enhancement and outcome evaluation. She's passionate about perinatal and infant mental health, service development, family-centred, community-based care, collaborative practice, training and advocacy. And she's been a key person in um, uh, chairing, uh, uh, along with Libby, the um, committee, local organising committee for the World Congress for next year now. A third speaker is Professor Jane Barlow, her topic, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the ability of key community-based professionals to safeguard infants and young children. Jane is a board member of WAME, very involved in the affiliate organisation, but uh, in her other job, in her day job, she's Professor of Evidence-Based Intervention and Policy Evaluation in the Department of Social uh, policy and intervention at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on developing and evaluating dietic interventions during the perinatal period uh, that are aimed at promoting infant mental health. Uh, coordinated a number of Cochrane reviews. Jane also undertakes research to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions aimed at preventing child abuse. Currently, President of AIM UK, Affiliate Council, representative on the Executive Board of AIM, as I mentioned and Associate Editor for the Infant Mental Health Journal. Um, she was a member of Prevail, an organisation uh, called uh, Preventing Violence Across the Lifespan. So they're our key speakers. Um, uh, and uh, I'm just going to make uh, another comment that uh, we are in Infant Mental Health Week. 
Um, and one of the key uh, messages coming through from the organisations uh, here and in the UK is seeing through the eyes of babies. How can we see the world uh, through the baby's eyes? Because it's not taken for granted. We often don't see the baby's experience of trauma, of fear, of pain, abandonment, and abandonment and loss, perhaps because it's too painful for us because of our own work uh, contacts, uh, because of our own personal experiences. But it's also true that um, we can miss the infant's experience of joy and happiness, of playfulness, which is there right from the start. We know that infants can be withdrawn and depressed in the face of trauma. And it's important for us to listen to the infant's world, to the toddler's world, to see what they see. And uh, I think our three speakers are going to take us on a journey through that. So I'm going to um, hand over now to Sally um, uh, and her talk again is Implemental Health Awareness Week needed now more than ever. Sally Hogg. Thank you very much, Campbell. I'll just share my screen so you can see my slides. So I hope you can now see those slides. Um, it's fantastic to be with you. I would obviously, of course, much rather be there in Brisbane for Wayne, but I'm really grateful um, for organising this seminar so that we can have this really important discussion in the absence of being together in person. So I'm just going to talk um, a bit today about Infant Mental Health Awareness Week, um, why we're running it, um, where it came from, um, and the context in which we're running it, and why it's therefore needed more than ever. So I'll start with just a bit of an introduction. Um, I am from the Parent Infant Foundation. We're a, a very small um, but kind of um, but powerful organisation in the UK. You might have formerly heard of us as we were, used to be called PIP UK. We were rebranded last year. And we um, do three things really. We focus on the, the kind of specialist end of care for parent infant relationships. So we work to um, enable and expand um, and grow the provision of um, specialised parent infant relationship teams across the UK. So those are multidisciplinary teams with a particular focus on work from pregnancy to two and on strengthening relationships during that time. Um, there are about 30 of those teams already across the UK and we work with them um, to ensure that they're um, secure, sustainable and operating as effectively as possible. And because they're often quite small and quite isolated, um, we can play an important role in helping them to uh, to come together, to share experience, to build evidence together and to really make a strong case for why the work they do is so important. And then alongside that, um, the work that I lead for the Parent Infant Foundation is around policy and campaigning. So giving babies and the services that work with them a compelling voice um, at a, both a local and a national level um, to really campaign for change. And we do that um, as the Parent Infant Foundation and with a network of teams across the country specifically around talking about the importance of specialised provision but we also work with partners across the sector to talk about the need for the whole spectrum, a whole pathway of care to support early relationships. Um, we coordinate the Conception to two, Age 2 or Party Parliamentary Group in the Westminster Parliament so that brings together parliamentarians from across the political spectrum um, to think about what they can do to champion uh, early life and early relationships and infant mental health. And we also coordinate the first 1001 Days movement. Um, I noticed when Campbell was introducing that he kind of that he talked about 1000 and 1001 Days. I know the rest of the world often talks about 1000 Days and we've got our extra one. And we have talked about whether or not we should, uh, should come together and, and have just 1000, but we decided to keep our one because it's, it kind of gives a unique identification to the movement in the UK which are working together around this important period. Um, so we have, well at the time when we launched Infant Mental Health Awareness Week last weekend, the movement had over 130 organisations and 150 professional supporters. That's actually gone up and we're looking at, um, we've had 20 more organisations express an interest in joining this week. So it's an ever-growing movement. Um, we work together to ensure that um, 
that we can drive change together and, and kind of be a united voice talking about the importance of um, early emotional well-being and development and early relationships and our vision and mission are on this slide which were really carefully co-produced between all of the members of the, of the movement. We bring together um, charities and professional bodies across children's services, families, mental health um, and, uh, and maternity and a lot of people who talked about infant mental health but did so in different ways talked about perhaps home learning environment or um, early relationships or attachment and one of the things we try and do is to bring everybody together so that we can talk with a common language and really focus our shared passion about the importance of early life collectively in order to drive change. Now I know that at previous Wayne Congresses we've, um, we've presented a bit about the 1001 Days work in the UK so I thought it might be um, useful just to slightly deviate from my kind of main purpose today just to give um, some of you a bit more of an update about where the movement has got to. So our history is that we, um, we started in 2013 when there was a, a, a manifesto launched, the 1001 Critical Days Manifesto was launched in the UK Parliament. And at that point, uh, uh, hundreds of organisations came together at the launch event and put their logos on the manifesto and started to work together around championing the importance of the first 1001 days. Um, and uh, we, that was kind of um, work that was ongoing. But what we did at the end of last year was to think about just taking stock a bit of where we got to and what the successes of that work were and what more we needed to do to really make a difference for babies and their families. So um, over the autumn and, and uh, winter of 2019 and 2020, we ran a huge consultation and co-production exercise to really think about how can, what can all of these passionate organisations and individuals do to really make sure that actually the work we're doing is making a change for babies and their families. And we reviewed a bit of what we've done so far. So there were massive strengths that we've done over the kind of first six years of the movement around raising the awareness and the profile of the first 1001 days. So it's definitely true that in Westminster and in um, UK government documents, the kind of the importance of early life and early relationships and early mental health is now acknowledged in a way that it wasn't perhaps 10 years ago. Um, people are talking about this and one of the things that the movement did was start to distill kind of some of that evidence and give people ways of talking about it that were helpful. So we were seen as a kind of valued source of expertise. And we were also very good at connecting people and getting people involved. So if we held an event in Westminster with you know, a room for 200, we, it would be fully booked within the first morning of it being available. People wanted to be part of this movement. There's a real passion about it. But we also had to be honest with ourselves that actually, um, whilst the movement had done a lot, policy in the UK for babies and their families had um, really often gone in the wrong direction over that 10 years. There'd been a lot of cuts in important services, lots of important indicators around breastfeeding and infant mortality and child poverty. Well, they were either stagnant or they were going in the wrong direction. And so we needed to think hard about how could we really influence change? I think one of the things, if we were honest with ourselves, that we'd done is we'd created a really strong narrative that what happens in early life affects children's later outcomes. But what we hadn't done is created a problem that politicians needed to solve. We hadn't said what is wrong at the moment or where is there an opportunity to do more or how could this make the UK better or how could this help them tackle the outcomes that they were trying to tackle later on. We hadn't created that narrative about why there needed to be action and there needed to be change. Um, and that was, a real, that was something we needed to do better. We also, whilst we kind of could fill rooms with people and everybody felt very collaborative and working together, we weren't necessarily harnessing the voice and the power of all of those organisations um, and kind of projecting it outwards enough to affect change. And so we went through this process of thinking about how we could do that better. Um, and that's how we've created a new vision and mission for the movement, which are the ones I shared with you earlier. We've agreed a clearer role for ourselves and we've drawn up a consensus statement which sets out um, a kind of shared narrative about the first 1,001 days and why it matters and also some key headlines of what we want to see from policymakers. We've created ourselves as a more formal alliance, so we're now a kind of membership alliance which, which either organisations or individuals can join. What we also have now, therefore, is a mandate 
to speak on behalf of all of those organisations and to put out um, letters or um, submissions to government evidence inquiries on behalf of 130 or more organisations and kind of use the collective power more visibly. Um, and we've got this lovely new brand as well to start talking to, to start using. So the role that we've agreed is it has four parts: translating evidence both from research and from uh, professional practice into compelling messages to affect change, using our collective voice um, to in inform change nationally and locally, and uh, raising awareness amongst the public and the media in order to help drive that change. We're really clear that we are a campaigning organisation that looks at decision makers, policy makers and commissioners of services. We're not a, a kind of parent education campaign, but sometimes in order to affect change, particularly in our kind of very populist politics at the moment, you need to bring people with you. And so we do look at what we can do in the, in the media and public facing work in order to create that kind of movement for change. So that's a bit of background. Um, so why did we really think that Infomental Health Awareness Week was needed? Just a bit of context in the UK at the moment. Um, so I should say that the UK is obviously four nations um, and nations that are quite different, particularly on social policy. And uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are, I would say, off the head of, of the Westminster government in terms of a lot of, of issues around infant mental health. The Scottish government in particular has put parent and infant mental health as part of its kind of headline programme for government and is um, investing across a whole spectrum of services. And there's also work going on in, in Wales and Northern Ireland as well. But I'll talk a little bit specifically about the UK wide government in Westminster. Um, so there has been increasing recognition across a number of parliamentary groups around um, the the problems around Westminster um, policy for children um, under two, so the first 1,001 days. Over the last couple of years, there have been three different select committees, education, health and science, have all called government out for the lack of work um, on, uh, to support families in the early years of life. And this is just some quotes from um, the science committee uh, last year talking about the lack of overarching national strategy for early childhood in the UK, no oversight and a really fragmented approach. And this is all, it's very true and it's very worrying. We really lack coherent joined up policy for, for children generally in the UK and particularly for our littlest children. Um, and that's quite depressing for those of us that have been working in UK policy for the last 10, 15 years, because we used to be much better um, back in 2005, we had the Every Child Matters agenda and we brought together um, policy for children um, into one government department with a lead cabinet minister with a real out focus on outcomes. But that has all gone very backwards over the last decade. There is some good stuff happening, particularly investment in perinatal, so maternal mental health services at the very high end, specialist services, um, and also reforms to our maternity services. And some of those things will have a huge impact on infant mental health. But infant mental health is very, very rarely actually ever acknowledged in those policy discussions as something that, that as a kind of direct aim of those policies. Um, there's also been a lot of very worrying stuff happening. So um, we've seen over the last decade enormous cuts in funding for services. Um, and in the capacity of services across the spectrum, universal targeted and specialist services um, that would promote infant mental health. Um, it, we had this wonderful Sure Start program in the UK, which you know, was, was developing and the evidence was emerging and it wasn't perfect everywhere, but there was real opportunities and, and that has um, just fallen by the wayside as part of government cuts. Um, and our health visitor numbers, so our, our kind of public health nurses who support families in the first 1,000 days and beyond. Um, again, they had um, up to 2015 had been growing and then there's been an enormous cut um, as, a lack, as, as a result of um, cuts to public health budgets in the UK. So lots of things going in the wrong direction. And, this, and also not on this slide, but our wider kind of context and that 
um, the world in which children live in the UK is also getting harder. Our child poverty rates are rocketing. Um, lots of things are going in the wrong direction for our children. Um, in terms of mental health provision, particularly for babies and toddlers, um, there is a real gap in services. So um, my team did a, a freedom of information work, piece of work last year where we asked commissioners of, of mental health services in the UK what they offered for children under two. And 42% of local areas said that their mental health services wouldn't accept a referral for children two and under. And of those that would, actually when we got them to share the data, many of them actually weren't really seeing children of that age, even if, even if technically they would take a referral. And there were lots of problems around that, around babies' needs not being understood, not being recognised across the whole system and therefore not, not being a demand for these services, um, and the lack of specialist provision within mental health services to support babies' needs. Um, and some of you might recognise the guys on this slide. I think that um, Dominic Cummings is uh, the PM's main advisor in the UK and has um, become fairly famous as a result of his approach to lockdown rules recently. Um, but there are many worrying things about Dominic Cummings, one of which is that he denies the importance of early life. And these are some quotes from his blogs, um, kind of denying the impact of parenting and parental influence and um, the value of, of early interventions. So we're in a difficult place policy-wise in the UK. Um, and that's why it's really important that the First Thousand Days movement and all of our organisations are really effective in kind of challenging and scrutinising government policy. So that was the context back in December when we planned Infant Mental Health Awareness Week for 2020. Um, and we decided on this theme of seeing the world through baby's eyes, playing on the 2020, the year and the idea of 2020 vision, and thinking that this theme would allow us to talk about two different things. Um, a kind of policy level to talk about what our babies are seeing, what the world is like, what the UK is like to be a baby and to highlight some of those kind of policy and contextual factors I've just been talking about. But also to talk about the really positive practice that is happening whereby professionals are helping parents to see the world through baby's eyes and the real wonderful change that can happen um, when they do that. So we started 2020 looking forward to this week and having fantastic plans and then uh, COVID-19 hit. And we did at one point talk about whether we should still be running Infant Mental Health Awareness Week and we, it was really clear to us that actually it was obviously needed more than ever. Um, the challenges that COVID-19 has brought to our babies I think will be really familiar to all of you and a lot has been written about them and acknowledged. Um, this weekend in the UK will be the point at which um, babies born in 2020 in this decade in the UK have spent more than half of their life in lockdown um, and there are huge stresses on families all of those things that I already talked about jobs and insecurity poverty that were already problematic prior to COVID have got a lot worse um, massive increases in domestic abuse and likely increases in neglect and child abuse as well but we, we hear about the, the domestic abuse and adults we don't hear about the children's stuff so much um, real specific problems around pregnancy and, and birth. Um, uh, for a while, um, in some hospitals, women were not allowed any birthing partners. Um, that thankfully has changed, thanks to campaigning. Um, but dads are still not allowed to stay around to visit antenatal or postnatal wards. Um, our NICU units in many places have only allowed one parent to visit. And often that means that dads haven't been able to see babies in NICU. Our health visitors, um, at a time when they were already depleted and at a time when they were needed more than ever, have, have been redeployed in some places. Um, a lot of services have been moved online and there's been some fantastic um, adaption and really hard work from professionals to deliver services online. But often we know that the baby is invisible um, when services are online and those wider kind of contextual factors and, and really making those con connections with families through which change are made are harder. And in the last week, some of our childcare settings have reopened to children under two with social distancing measures in place, which make it very hard to think about how those can be nurturing environments for the youngest children. So, for example, the government guidance says that at drop off, 
parent should stay two metres away from childcare professionals, which works if you've got a preschooler that might kind of run between one adult and another, but it's difficult to see how a kind of nurturing transition for a small baby could happen in that environment. So lots, lots to be worried about. We've done some research with our partners to get parents' experiences um, and to get them to talk about what their baby might be experiencing at that time. And um, we're not in a place to release the full results yet, but some of the stats we are releasing today show that parents are reporting that their babies are being affected by a lockdown and they're worried about this. And the, and the survey shows how parents want support to think about and support their babies and toddlers through the impact of COVID, but they're struggling to find that support. So when COVID hit, we hadn't relaunched the first 1,001 Days movement in our new form. We were kind of just about to do it. And we've had to really scramble because despite not yet being kind of public, we wanted to really make sure we were talking about COVID-19 and championing babies. And we've done a lot as a movement um, to raise awareness of um, the challenges specifically for babies and their parents of COVID-19. And to flag that as so often happens all the time babies are so are forgotten about so much of the discussion about children and COVID-19 thinks about school-aged children so much of the government guidance so much of the policy announcements is about children who are missing school and that's not talking about the little children and the babies and the impact this is having on them and we are just constantly trying to to campaign to get babies on the agenda and to get their needs thought about and so in that context, Infomental Health Awareness Week was needed more than ever. Um, and we um, set a number of kind of themes to talk about over the week, building kind of COVID into the activity that we already had planned. Um, we launched the week on Sunday with a letter to the Prime Minister talking about how perhaps in the discussions about recovery from COVID and in the in thinking about how we might build back better after this crisis, that might be an opportunity for him and, and how babies need to be considered. And um, we've also launched things that we were already planning to do, like the infographic, which Campbell showed earlier, and all of these are available. And there's been absolutely amazing activity, despite all of the challenges that COVID has presented across the UK and across the world around Infomental Health Awareness Week, from people doing um, baby groups online and lovely videos for parents to a lot of kind of professional webinars and training and, and events as well so we've been absolutely thrilled by what's happened there's been activity all around the world this is just a map from a twitter analytics that i took last night showing kind of how i mean obviously not there's huge gaps in this but there is this stuff happening across the um across lots of bits of the world during Infomental health awareness week and the the twitter analytics at 10 o'clock last night, UK time, showed the reach of the, our hashtag was up to 2.5 million people. So we, you know, we've, we've created a lot of activity, which we hope will translate into some real change and, and has led to a kind of increased awareness of the movement as well, which we hope creates good foundations for us to do some of the campaigning and influencing work we want to do going forward. Um, but we can't be complacent. So when I was, I was doing this kind of final slides late last night, I looked at our mental health minister and what she was saying. And she tweeted something about hedgehogs and not a lot about infant mental health or nothing about infant mental health. So we can't get complacent. We need to be careful not to be so surrounded by this wonderful echo chamber of passionate people um, that we, re we don't, that we kid ourselves that we've, we've really got to the people that mattered. Um, we've got a lot of work to do to convince those parliamentarians and politicians in the UK to do something about babies. But we've made a really good start and I'm so grateful to everybody attending today for your support for Implemental Health Awareness Week and it's great to be working with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sally. That was uh, amazing and uh, uh, you've given us a huge uh, inspiration. I've been inspired by the um, uh, Parent Infant Foundation material and that survey that you did through um, the mental health services and other services in the UK, I think is a very important statement about um, uh, what people think they're doing and what they're not actually doing. So to be able to get that level of um, political um, uh, influence and uh, underway, the groundswell of people behind is really amazing. And, uh, and there's already been a number of comments about how can we um, uh, 
continue that movement in other countries around the world. So thank you very, very much. And we'll have some questions maybe about uh, uh, where you've led us uh, later on. So staying in the UK, but uh, I guess moving um, up to Oxford, um, we'll uh, invite Jane Barlow, Professor Jane Barlow to, to present her uh, talk, The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on the Ability of Key Community-Based Professionals to Safeguard Infants and Young Children. Jane. Um, yeah, I wasn't one of the people that were going to be fortunate, fortunate enough to, um, to come to, to Brisbane this year. So um, it's, um, I'm hoping that uh, the deferred start date uh, will enable me, me to be there. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about a, a very um, rapid piece of research that we have done over the past four weeks. So it's, um, it's hot off the press and still really... Uh, still really ongoing and the aim of the um, aim of the survey was to look at the impact of COVID-19 um, on the ability of community-based practitioners to keep babies and young children safe um, and, and my, my subtitle for this of course as Sal said is you know who is keeping uh, the baby in in mind. So the the key piece of policy context that we were um, really interested in was the changes to practice and in particular uh, community-based practice that had been instigated um, once, the, um, once the pandemic kicked in back in March. There was a range of um, documentation uh, put out giving practitioners um, instructions with regard in particular to the process of social distancing. So the guidance really required um, limited contact in terms of the um, delivery of services. And um, you can see the second bullet point, there was a service prioritization document and um, the services that were listed there were, were on the whole mostly to be delivered using uh, virtual methods um, with face-to-face uh, -face contact in the home or clinic um, only provided where there was, um, and this term was used, um, a compelling reason um, to do so. So in terms of uh, midwives and health visitors, um, the service prioritisation document said that all services should be discontinued um, other than antenatal contact, which um, you know, was, was to be done virtually where possible, and, uh, and new baby visits and other uh, contacts uh, to be assessed and stratified uh, for vulnerable or cl clinical need. S in addition to that, there was emergency legislation which was um, enacted, I think probably about a, a, a month into the pandemic that, that really involved um, the National Pandemic Service being um, implemented. And as part of that, um, the aim was to redeploy um, staff who were um, not regarded as, as being uh, frontline um, in order to um, in order to release their um, in order to enable them to um, help with the um, critical pandemic services. And we began to realise that there was um, concern um, about. Uh, the implications of these on uh, the practice of key frontline uh, practitioners such as um, health visitors and midwives. And this, this slide here shows the results of a, um, a survey that was undertaken by the Institute of Health Visitors asking them about um, how um, COVID-19 was impacting on them. And you can see um, that there three key points, inconsistent practice across the country, particularly in terms of the use of face-to-face -face visits, and also in terms of the availability and use of PPE. There was concern also about the fact that health visitors appeared fairly early on in the proceedings to be one of the key um, professional groups who were being redeployed um, to other uh, healthcare areas. And this, of course, as Sal said, was on top of an already significantly um, depleted workforce, leaving um, you know, a severely stressed uh, workforce picking up the uh, remainder of the cases. 
And of course, um, there were significant concerns being raised fairly soon um, into the pandemic with regard to its secondary impact on children and families through um, you know, the, the increase in domestic violence, safeguarding mental health, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we approached the, um, oh, sorry. We approached, yes, yeah, so that, sorry, the next couple of slides are just about um, summarizing some of the uh, research that was about fairly early on that, um, you know, that confirmed in no uncertain manner um, the increased stresses that families were uh, facing during the pandemic. And, you know, one of these was um, increased poverty and in particular uh, food insecurity. And you, you can see the data here, 1.5 million adults in Britain say that they can't obtain um, um, enough food um, with free, free, half of parents with, with children with, who are eligible for free school meals not having received any substitute meals to keep their children fed. So you can see significant stresses for families on that front. And also, you know, not formal data, but data from a number of sources, police, helplines, national charities, um, suggested that domestic abuse had increased significantly um, during the uh, course of the pandemic. And you can see this uh, piece of data here. So refuge were 49% higher in the week uh, prior to the 15th of April than the average um, for that prior to the, uh, prior to the uh, pandemic. And their helpline website had increased by 700% um, compared with the, with the previous day. So the wider service context, before I go on to talk about the, the research, was, as um, Sal said, lots of children's centres being closed, um, expenditure on children's services uh, being uh, the same as it was in, in, in 2010, and much of that now being devoted to look after children. Um, few services, the Rare Jewels report, few services to refer families on to. And I think particularly in terms of um, our concern with, with babies, really, the, um, you know, this survey, survey by the Institute of Health Visitors found that you know, a third of health visitors were responsible, responsible for between 500 and 1,000 children when we recognise that the optimum number is um, 250. Um, despite them being mandatory, only a third of health visitors were able to offer an antenatal contact to the family and 81% of health visitors reported that they, they weren't conducting 12 month reviews and even more were not completing the 2 to 2.5 year review. So this is the context within which we um, approached the government. Um, the, um, I'm part of a children's policy and research unit and we approached the government and said could we uh, do a survey to address these research questions. So primarily we wanted to know um, what the impact had been um, in terms of the required changes to practices on practice on the uh, in terms of the new documentation particularly in terms of vulnerable pregnant women and family and vulnerable families with um, preschool children. And the data that I'm going to talk to you about today, I've selected out the, um, the, the findings specifically uh, relating to um, health visitors and midwives. And then we were also wanting to know what the key priorities for these groups are going forward as we, um, you know, as we move out of the, the lockdown and um, what, what their perceptions were about what was needed to enable uh, services to get back to a, um, you know, a, a normal sort of uh, level of functioning. So we did an online survey of uh, local authority managers and commissioners. Not, I'm not presenting that data today. We did a survey also of key professionals. We included social workers, health visitors, midwives and community practitioners, but the, um, the, the, the brief was on preschool children and were interested specifically today on um, pregnant women, babies, and, and, and the, you know, that end of the continuum. So I'm really just going to present the data to you from, um, from the health visitors and, um, and midwives. And we were particularly interested in um, you know, vulnerable families. So these are children in need or children on the edge of care, um, uh, you know, the, 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 a very significant uh, uh, group of families who um, who are already um, in the system to uh, some extent 
uh, although not necessarily because we know um, that many of these families are still um, invisible uh, to service providers. And we're also now doing the second stage, which is the in-depth uh, telephone interviews with, um, with 30 of the uh, practitioners who, who took part in the survey. So these were our results, and we, 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 had a, we had a really good response rate, given that this was only open over the course of um, about a week. And we only had about a week to set it up. And I think that really, uh, you know, really reflected the fact that practitioners, um, you know, had a, had a lot to say, really, and, and weren't feeling particularly well heard. So 861 practitioners, of whom three quarters were, were health visitors, um, only 6% were midwives and the remainder were social workers and community paediatricians. So you can see the, the, the data for health visitors is, is 641 and uh, 58 midwives took part. So just about all practitioners said that there had been uh, an increase, um, a significant increase in their concerns about families and this table um, summarizes the um, the type of concerns that were um, the key types of concerns about which um, there, there, there were expressions um, and you can see here safeguarding health visitors 25 percent a third increase significant increase in domestic abuse concerns about interestingly um, mid, uh, midwives um, 72% uh, said that they'd got significant increase in terms of mental health problems. And that, you know, that probably, uh, you know, reflects the anxiety uh, for, uh, for many pregnant women. So a significant um, additional burden, really, in terms of um, vulnerability over and above um, the existing uh, vulnerability uh, that was already there. Um, despite this increase in need, um, health visitors were the most likely in our survey to report uh, being redeployed. Um, and many of them um, reported having as many as, as five members of, of their team um, who'd been redeployed and a third of them um, saying that they'd received um, inadequate preparation uh, for their new roles. And they'd mostly um, they'd mostly been taken from their health visiting role to a range of other settings, um, you know, adult physical um, healthcare settings, hospital, district and community nursing and, um, and adult services. And um, somebody said to me, did I take the redeployed people out of the survey? Well, actually, we, we didn't because there was so much chaos really around their, their redeployment experiences and, and many of them this 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 health visitor said I was meant to be redeployed. I was told to get rid of my caseload and stay at home to await redeployment details. I was told I was not allowed to contact any of my caseload, even though the health visitors who've been left behind were drowning in work. I sat at home for three weeks, scraping around for training to do. And the day before I was due to start my new role, I was told I was coming back into health visiting as my new employer didn't uh, need me as there wasn't enough work. And that, that, that really typifies um, the way in which health visitors were withdrawn um, without consultation. Many of them didn't know why they'd been uh, redeployed or, or, for, uh, or for how long. Or, um, and and very, very often they were then uh, sent, sent, uh, sent back. And I, I, I mean, my personal feeling is that this really reflects um, an, uh, the way in which health visiting isn't sufficiently well valued. And th th this actually was said also by one of the uh, one of the participants. She said it's also that people don't value uh, what health visitors do. I, I think it feels too light for them. They don't get this mentalization bit. I, I don't think, you know, they don't get reflective functioning or well, they've been trained in it, but it's it's really no, no longer in their mind. So. Um, so for them, and a, a number of people said this, it's now about the KPIs um, that, that have to be met rather than, um, you know, rather than them as practitioners being able to think about um, how they can uh, do an assessment and how they can um, support a, a particular family. 
So the guidance stipulated um, reduced um, um, visits to the home and clinic visits were uh, uh, reduced as well, any direct face-to-face -face contact. You can see here, however, that there was a significant difference between the number of midwives who continued um, to do um, um, visits. So they had 79% um, of them had more than 40% of their um, um, workload involved home visits compared with only um, only 3% of um, health visitors. And you can see, you know, the difference um, at, at that end of the continuum as well. And I, 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 I do wonder if that reflects the um, ongoing sort of physical nature of, of midwifery in the sense that it's much easier to justify um, you know, having a face-to-face -face contact with somebody when there's, you know, potentially the need to physically examine um, uh, mum, you know, in some way. It, this, this health is said, I did a developmental check, um, one year check over the phone, and I thought everything was fine. And then the next week I got an invite to a family conference for this family because they've been drug dealing in the house and the baby was at risk. So I think, what would have happened if I'd gone round? Would I still have come up with the, uh, with the same decision uh, that the baby was um, fine and not at risk that she uh, that she did uh, in fact come up with and if and, and I asked her how how this family had come to the attention of, of um, children's social care services and she said it, it was the neighbors um, the neighbors were so concerned about the number of people coming and going uh, from from the house um, that they uh, they ran children's social care and th this health visitor said our safeguarding caseload has increased significantly. Uh, we're not able to follow up concerns being raised and have been told to only contact those safeguarding families once. We're no longer allowed to offer follow up support contacts or if we do, this is to be one phone call only. Um, the safeguarding families are hardly having any contact from the health visiting team and those of us who are left have had to take on cases without any handover, um, handover information. So another thing that we wanted to explore was um, if they were using, um, you know, fewer face-to-face uh, face, um, methods uh, in terms of their contact with families. And this slide shows the contact for midwives. Um, you can see we asked them how, what proportion of their antenatal pre-post-birth visits and other visits were being done by phone or by text. Um, you, you, you can see for um, midwives, the, the, the columns in red, that there are still quite a large um, proportion of, of home visits being done, um, with phone uh, being the uh, next main method of service delivery. And I thought it was, I thought it was actually very interesting that um, while health visitors seem to have moved uh, pretty well en masse to using uh, video calls, um, very few midwives were, were, were doing any video calls or whatsoever. And if we look at this next slide, which doesn't quite seem to be, there we go. So this is the methods of service provision for health visitors. You can see, you know, antenatal contacts, only 12% were, were being done face to face in the home. Um, it goes up quite considerably for uh, families where there is um, on, ongoing risk. But, but I think, you know, children with special needs, quite, quite a different picture to, to that for um, health visitors. And you can see here in the video calls that, um, you know, nearly a quarter of their, uh, their calls were being done using video with, um, you know, other, other methods being used as well, the phone and, um, and, and, and text. We asked them what proportion of their workforce they felt were not receiving um, adequate care. And you can see at the bottom, we got um, 40 to 60% and more than 60%. And um, you, know, you can see that there are significant numbers here. Well, it, even if we started at 20 to 40% not receiving um, adequate care, you can see there's a significant proportion of their um, of the people on their caseloads who they perceive not to be receiving adequate care at this, this point in time. And, and if you bear in mind the fact that we're talking about 
their high risk families, not, um, not their universal population. So um, some of the qualitative data that this health visitor said, say face-to-face -face contact is required, especially for increased caseload families, um, no visual field to identify concerns, parents not really willing to engage on the, on the phone, and the UP, UPP is their high, high risk end of the caseload. Um, inability to make contact due to current health pandemic is placing vulnerable children more at risk of potential harm and undisclosed abuse. This second health visitor said, I'm not home visiting, not assessing needs. Uh, there are many, many children that are right now invisible. And they're already a lot invisible be before. So that this is uh, you know, a further added to that. And therefore, one could argue the greatest risk of harm for a long time with no safety net of nursery, children's centres or schools providing support or assessment or, uh, or signposting. This health visitor said, we have to go through our manager to arrange child protection contacts and then try to obtain PPE. Vulnerable children are not on the radar of managers. We need either PPE or specialist clinics or specialist sessions at nurseries to support and monitor families. And this, this health visitor said, vulnerable children don't count in the KPIs. They're the key performance indicators. The whole commissioning process needs review urgently. Um, all the changes to different providers cause mayhem. Uh, and many providers really don't have a clue about the complexities of the health visitor role. And I think that is uh, reflected really in the, um, the speed at which um, people um, redeployed uh, health visitors to other areas of, of work. In terms of virtual online care, so as we said, health visitors were uh, much more likely to be using um, online platforms of, of some sort. Of those people who weren't using them, the, the, the main reasons were um, IT problems or insufficient uh, training or their perception was that, that, that it wasn't needed. Um, other reasons for not being able to deliver them were that the clients really were not reliably able to um, attend online meetings and actually a significant proportion um, of the participants said that their, the clients about whom they had most concern very often didn't have access to um, online platforms. So, you know, the, the, there's an equity um, issue there. And actually, there was also an issue for practitioners because many of them were working from home. They said they didn't feel comfortable to undertake their work from home using video calls. It felt intrusive. They said they felt it jeopardised the professional distance um, that would normally be there to enable them to undertake their work because it was in effect bringing the family into the home. And perhaps, and well, I was going to say perhaps most shockingly, but maybe it isn't the most shocking uh, thing, but, but most, most two-thirds of respondents, two-thirds of um, uh, practitioners hadn't received any training whatsoever uh, for uh, delivering services in this way. Um, and, but health visitors were more, more likely to have done so than midwives, and that may um, explain why they were, uh, there were more health visitors than midwives um, using them. So the practitioners who did use them, they said it saved time, it was good for some clients who preferred to do it that way, it gave them access to families that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to, and uh, you know, clear, clearly there were cost and, and time savings. Um, the, the top three reasons for, for in terms of their limitations were inability to access families, IT issues, and mostly um, inability to provide you know some aspects of care. Um, and I think um, and, and I think that was um, you know the key issue for for many people. So so people went on to say this health visitor went on to say I can't identify changes in facial expression if it's a phone call can't see the bond between parents and children can't see the care provided can't see the home conditions or the condition of the children don't get to speak to the children. But another health visitor said difficulty in picking up nonverbal cues that are easily picked up in face to face contact assessment of home environment can be challenging not all parents are good with technology assessments are, are time consuming. So two thirds of respondents said they would be willing to continue um, using um, virtual face-to-face -face care after the pandemic, but, but overall they were quite clear that these were not the right way of, of, of delivering care to, 
uh, to, to, to vulnerable families. A massive increase in the workload, uh, many working at home, and for those who were working at home, um, nearly a third reported an increase of more than um, more than 40% in their workload, and I, I think many of us can uh, uh, sympathise uh, with, with that. Significant impact on uh, on their well-being. So one fifth of practitioners reported that it had had a significant impact. Um, so on a scale of uh, naught to ten. Uh, the majority were reporting themselves as being somewhere between seven and, and nine um, in terms of stress. And interestingly, um, it was the uh, performance of management that, uh, that was the main cause of the stress. So Ms. Helsworth says there's been an offer of occupational health, but the solution is more staffing. I can learn to cope with my own mental health needs, but it makes no difference when you go back out there and cannot cope with the workload. I feel offering mental health support is like putting a plaster on something. The real solution is we need more health visitors. This second health visitor said, mostly it would be helpful if we had less idiotic diktats via email, which often indicate they have no idea what we do. I'm a professional. They could try asking us instead of all the information flow um, from the uh, top down. So the key takeaway messages were, despite the fact that there was a widely recognised everywhere by everyone uh, increase in need and risk, large sections of the health visitor workforce do seem to have been uh, redeployed on a pretty um, chaotic um, basis, uh, which for some meant just a few days out. Um, but you know, waiting long periods without doing anything on their on their caseload. Limitations on home visits meant that critical services really weren't being delivered, and and that was true also for uh, social workers. Um, the cessation of universal visits meant that um, health visitors, uh, in particular, weren't able to do the identification of the increased vulnerability was at, that was out there, and their view was that these children were. Um, more at risk than they had ever been because they were not being seen by anybody. Um, significant delivery of services virtually with no preparation or training. Um, there's no evidence regarding its use with these families and uh, many families are not able to receive care in, in that way. And so the, the changes have had a significant impact on um, you know, the, the mental health, mental health of the mental health of the workforce. And so our, my concluding slide uh, is just a couple of statements about uh, the uh, impact then of um, these, this changed guidance with regard to practice. Um, it, I think, has to be that it's significantly undermined the ability of health and social care practitioners to safeguard um, babies and young children. And, you know, this is at a time when the risk has been um, significantly increased. Um, as a result of domestic abuse, et cetera, and also increased uh, uh, as a result of the removal of the standard safety nets that are there uh, in terms of nursery schools and, and perhaps um, most significantly the input of health visitors. So these uh, babies are completely uh, invisible uh, for, for the better part. And I think, I think it has to be said that there isn't anybody particularly keeping them in mind, despite the fact that you know many practitioners want and are trying hard to do so. I think that's my last slide. Yes. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, that's a very uh, uh, salutary and uh, important uh, uh, bit of uh, work that you've a huge bit of work that you've done with um, really dedicated people trying to do a job. Uh, to support families and infants and uh, pregnant women and in the midst of uh, uh, another um, uh, chaotic situation. Um, and I think uh, uh, the dedication, the commitment of uh, health visitors, uh, midwives and, and other people that you've surveyed comes through very clearly in, in what, you've, um, what you've described. Um, uh, and uh, again, we'll have some chance for discussion, a little bit of discussion and question later on. And, uh, but now I'd, I'd like to turn to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hone in Brisbane. And uh, Elizabeth's talk is entitled Creating Stories to Support Infants and Young Children During Disruptive Events. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth.
Okay, good evening from Australia. Um, I know it's other times in other parts of the world and thank you very much for the opportunity um, to present this evening. Um, I'm presenting on creating stories to support infants and young children during disruptive events. I, um, as Campbell, would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, and sea countries throughout Australia and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge and honour children, parents and families, their carers and support networks experiencing mental health difficulties and substance use issues, particularly during the first 2000 days of life. So we've already heard quite a lot about um, the impact of COVID-19. Um, sorry, I just got a message on my screen. Um, the impact of COVID-19, but I really want us to think somewhat more broadly, I think about what's happening in 2020. It's particularly pertinent in Australia because I think as many of you right around the world would have been aware that prior to COVID-19 happening, um, Australia was really immersed in the tragedy of the bushfires right across the country. This had been on the back of many years of severe drought in the significant parts of our land and complicating that after the bushfires, there were significant areas that also had severe flooding. This is now in, I think, complicated even more in a context of a world that, um, sorry, um, is experiencing other crises on top of that with the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so I think that we're living in a world which for us as adults often feels incredibly surreal. We're struggling to kind of process what's happening in our world and around us um, and really coming to terms with that. But it's also a very frightening and unpredictable time for our youngest um, members of society. And as Jane has just so amazingly demonstrated with the very brief study that she's already, that she's done, it's some of these are, um, young people are just so invisible in, in this sort of setting. And in this kind of setting, there's often been for them a, a loss of a sense of safety and security, and often the loss of special things in the case of fire, floods and so on, that provide them with that sense of security. Um, on top of that, we have the social distancing implications um, at a time when emotional closeness is needed more than ever to support young children um, and their caregivers. A lot of feedback we've had through the work we've been doing is that emotions are difficult to read behind masks and not just masks, but other um, protective equipment. For example, it's very hard for children to read what's happening with firefighters who may be coming to help them or police or other um, workers that are coming to help support them in times of crisis. Um, we've got a situation where we've got families thrown together and some of that can be an amazingly wonderful bonus where there's this opportunity for families to bond and spend time in a way that otherwise would not happen. But as we've already clearly seen, it's also always not always safe for little people. We have reduced physical contact with support systems, pregnancy and birthing plans and early care may be impacted as we've already heard. And we have stressed and distressed caregivers. And it's really thinking about what does that mean for our little people, for babies and small children? What are they seeing in the faces of the people that are caring for them? As um, Jane said at the end, we have interruptions to nursery, to childcare, to early education programs. We've got closed libraries, playgrounds, parks and community facilities and increased hand washing, hygiene practices and cleaning. Businesses are closed, accommodation and jobs are lost for some families and there is enormous financial pressure on families. These changes are things that are registered by our youngest um, members of society, but we don't always think about how to best support them. So the work that I'm going to be presenting that our team um, is doing in Queensland 
really came initially out of work um, in the context of natural disasters. But that space over time is now talking much more about disruptive events um, rather than just natural disasters in a world that seems to be ever plagued by such um, disruptive events. So in this space where we've been working, we've been trying to think about, well, what helps most um, our, little, our little people when we're confronted with such disruptive experiences? And what we've learned is that restoring a sense of safety and security is paramount. So reassurance, it really supporting the parent-child relationship to provide that. Familiar things, familiar people, re-establishing routines so that children really get that sense of predictability back. Having clear boundaries and expectations and maintaining them. Acknowledging feelings. I mean, as I said, it's surreal for us as adults and we all have very big feelings about these experiences. We can empathise with the sadness, the distress. We're experiencing it ourselves with the change of how we're living. How do we actually provide language and support for our youngest members and being allowed, able to talk about that when often the parents who are caring for them struggle to do that themselves? Giving out that message that it's actually okay to talk about how you're feeling. And how do we help little people process these experiences? We know that we can do that through talking and drawing, playing and telling stories. And one of the things that really struck us, um, particularly coming from Australia where um, an oral tradition is such a significant part of um, the Indigenous culture here. And it is a, a tradition that's still very much part of many cultures around the world. That telling stories is a way that we can help children process their experiences. And a focus on the positive in amidst all the chaos finding a way to think about gratitude, hope, support, and a preparedness for the future is also something that's a really important part of thinking about. It's about giving children a sense of confidence and agency and building resilience for them going forward. And so after a considerable period of time, we created a suite of resources which we've called Birdie's Tree which emerged out of the work that the artists that we commissioned um, did. We have a, um, a website where these resources can be accessed. Um, and as I said, they were initially set up in the context of supporting children in natural disasters in a situation in Australia where that really is a very regular occurrence. It came on the back of um, 2011, um, where the, it, which was really the worst year on record at that time for natural disasters right around the world. There had been 332 major weather events in the world. Um, nearly 250 million people were affected. It had um, significant financial impacts across the world. And for us here in Queensland, 75% um, of Queensland that summer had been declared um, a state of natural disaster. We had had cyclones, massive floods, um, freak weather events. And my clinical team was seeing an increased number of young children presenting with symptoms of post-traumatic stress, anxiety, developmental regression and other emotional and behavioural disturbances. So we actually spent quite some time um, doing literature searches to find out what was available, what programs could we actually use to help our families and our little people at this time to kind of manage this. And it was actually really hard, as we've already seen, to see where was the baby in all of this. We found very little material for under threes at all at the time. Um, and so we were really left thinking, well, we had to come up with something for ourselves um, to meet this need. What we were able to sort of pull together, um, as any of us that work in the infant um, mental health space is, we were aware of what common reactions were to stress and disruption, that there were immediate effects for our babies, 
They could be fearful, anxious, hyper alert, sad, clingy, tearful, withdrawn, irritable, hard to settle or soothe, have appetite, sleep disturbances and regress behavior. And then more, much more persistent symptoms that we was, would start to see in terms of the relationships that they were having with their parents, the impact on family functioning, their sense of safety and confidence and a willingness to explore, developmental issues, and longer term impacts on their emotional health and well-being and physical health. So in Queensland, this is um, a recovery trajectory that is used by our government to think about um, how we respond um, to these disasters. I find this actually a very useful graph even to think about in our current um, context of COVID-19. And I, when I looked at it in terms of preparing this presentation, it kind of in a way almost mirrors um, the social media posts that I see every day. Um, that you sort of going along, there is um, sort of this trajectory between a feeling of invincibility and a feeling of vulnerability that we all tread on a day-to-day -day basis. And then an event happens and initially there's the denial, the shock, the disbelief, the disorientation. And then there is a, a sort of a honeymoon phase of response. And I think we've seen a lot of that. Um, we saw it in the bushfires. We've seen it um, with a lot of um, kindness um, sites in social media. But the other thing that is now starting to emerge is this period of discouragement, fatigue, stress, fatigue with lockdown, social isolation, starting to blame others for the situations we're finding ourselves in. And very quickly now, we're seeing an emergence of very significant mental health issues um, in adults, in young people, and also in our littlest members. And then from that period of time with support, with a, you know, a gradual easing of social restrictions, some life getting back to normal, we start to see an emergence and a recovery and phase out of that. I think we're all kind of holding our breath to see what that's going to look like coming out of COVID-19. I mean, that I think will vary enormously on the countries in the world. Um, this morning, we had a presentation for our grand rounds um, at our hospital, and we very much heard a story of the really profound impact it's likely to have in um, our lower income countries, and that they may well really struggle to come out of this trajectory. Um, so on the basis of that, we then started to look at prevention, early intervention, mental health promotion activities. We um, held focus groups in some of our worst impacted communities during the floods. We went to childcare centres and interviewed child. Um, the workers there um, spoke to families, really to try and understand what could happen and what could help support them. And in all of that, um, there was a repeated sort of picture of the use of stories. Um, the childcare workers talked very much about developing programs that could be embedded in their curriculum. And that if they had those programs, they could use them in a way of preparedness as well as um, in recovery in acute events. They very much were describing things as severe storms or um, heavy rain it was very triggering for the children after the floods and all the rain that we've had. And they were really looking for resources that, that would help them to scaffold what was happening emotionally for the children and help the children to make sense of it. So it was out of that that we started to look at how we could actually build a model of care. And this stepped care model was based on work that was being done in Queensland with um, older children and young people and adults um, in a mental health context. Interestingly, again, funding went to children and young people and adults, and we were not able to get any funding at the time for infants and to actually implement the model for the under five age group. 
So with that, we just kept trying to progress the work we were doing with our existing resources. And it took us seven years and finally a bit of um, additional money from the source um, to actually finally be able to launch this suite of resources um, to a point where um, we are now. We're still building the top of the pyramid, but it's very classically sort of built on a mental health promotion, prevention, early intervention, and then treatment model. So the Birdies Tree resources on our website um, really began with the idea of creating stories to help children understand about feelings and about the experiences and to really build a language and a capacity to dialogue for the parents with the children. Um, we then started, we developed an early childcare curriculum um, on the back of the information we'd received from our focus groups. And from that, um, we're currently working on the development of a recovery program that includes screening and assessment for the more vulnerable children. Um, an early intervention, um, several session early intervention program, and then a more detailed integrated mental health recovery program, um, all incorporating the initial resources that we had developed. So we finally managed to launch Birdie's Tree in November of 2018. Um, this is just one of the pictures out of one of the storybooks. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so these are the principles behind Birdie's Tree. The first is about connection and the building of relationship and strengthening the caregiving system to support the child. The second is around emotional regulation, having tools to help children feel safe and to manage big emotions. Um, developing an understanding, using storytelling to process and understand the event and building strengths and resilience, to build on strengths, coping skills and culture. Um, these are the books that we had created up until this year. Um, our health department had actually requested that we build, develop a book around um, more influenza epidemics. So we already had a book called Birdie and the Big Sickness. Unfortunately, in Birdie and the Big Sickness, um, there's actually vaccination and um, that's not something that's currently available in COVID. But as you can see, the other books are really for quite significant natural disaster events, which really reflected much of what happened around the world in 2011 and our local experiences in Australia. We now have an additional book that I'll show you in a minute, which is Birdie and the Virus. So we worked with our media and communications department at our children's hospital um, and collaborated with them to modify content of Birdie and the Big Sickness to actually make it specific to a virus where there's no vaccination and where there's the use of PPE and um, nasal swabs and other experiences that children would have under the current um, crisis. In addition to the storybooks, we have online games, information sheets and booklets um, for parents and educators, links to other resources um, and the early childhood curriculum. So this is Birdie and the Virus. Um, the books on the website can be read online as a flip book. Um, we very much wanted to try and have resources that were flexible that in the case um, of natural disasters if evacuation centres were set up that first responders would have access to material that they could give to families to use on iPads that parents could pick up on their mobile phones, provided that they have the internet coverage. But we also have hardcover versions of the books which we can um, distribute very quickly um, when they're needed. 
For Birdie and the Virus, the Media and Comms Department at the hospital have also created an animated reading of the story and there's a hand washing song um, to help support children um, really get their head around the need for an increased level of hygiene and to make that fun. So this is the page where you choose the interactive online games and you can see we've tried to focus much more on the younger age groups. Some of them are more for the three to five year olds rather than the one to three year olds, but very much having a mix of things and a focus on the fact that there are activities that parents or older children could do with the younger children together, really to continue to support the relationship between the parent and the child. We're currently modifying some of these games and adding to them to reflect um, content of the COVID crisis, but also um, learnings that we've had from the Australian bushfires. Um, these are some of the information and activity sheets um, for families that can be handed out. There are cartoons um, that parents can read with the children. Again, Purpose being using stories to generate discussion, um, to think about feelings, um, to help the children process the experiences. Um, more information for the parents. And the information's broken into two areas. One more into supporting families in pregnancy and very early parenthood, and the other one in supporting families with young children. There are, these are little booklets that have um, activities inside that can be used with children or tips for self-care for the um, parents, um, support services that you can access. One of the things that we've been able to do is, given that Australia has a very large multicultural population, um, is that we've been able to have a number of the books translated into the most common languages in our communities um, in Australia. Um, and we're continuing to grow the number of languages that the books have been translated into. And we're currently working with our education department in Queensland to translate them into um, an Auslan book, um, books as well. So the key messages we really wanted to get across for the children was that disasters are not your fault, you're safe and loved, you're not alone, distressing events do end, order will be restored, adults will take responsibility, that big feelings are okay to have and talk about and that there are people around you who can help you. And so the flow of each of the storybooks is really to try and identify and get across these key messages. For the adults, the messages are, you're not alone, distressing events end, order will be restored. It's okay to have big feelings and talk about them. Take care of yourself to take care of your children and help's available, don't be afraid to ask. One of the things um, that we found as we've rolled out the materials and used them quite extensively, we've now actually mailed out um, between 15 and 16,000 books across the various series um, since 2018 and had um, the additional hits online and people have used them um, electronically. Our experience has been it's not only the little children that have found them helpful, it's actually older children that have found them helpful. And it's actually helped parents to start processing and thinking about their own emotional situation in this. I think because the content is simple and straightforward, it's much more accessible to people in times of stress and crisis when we're emotionally aroused. Um, and so then having that as a way of talking about it as a family, uh, that seems to be quite a helpful way to um, start a process of thinking about this. And that had been the original feedback we'd had when we ran the focus group with the early childhood educators, because they very much said to us that the young children that would be exposed to this material would actually be 
the conduit to getting the messages out to families. So that some of the activities that we've put in the early childhood curriculum, for example, uh, to make finger puppets to tell the stories which the children could take home, colouring sheets for them to take home, to, and that then commences conversations around the dinner table or when children are picked up, what did you do today? Um, and leads into that the much broader family being exposed to the messages that we've been trying to get out. So the curriculum is to help early childhood educators to understand and respond to the emotional needs of babies, young children and their parents in the context of a natural disaster or disruptive event, recognise a child's need for additional support and help the family access help, and use self-care strategies to look after themselves and their own well-being. We're currently um, nearly at the end of an evaluation of the early childhood curriculum. Um, we have a PhD candidate who's been doing that evaluation for us across sites in Queensland and in New South Wales. And it's got very positive outcomes that are coming out of that. I haven't been able to kind of put the direct data up because um, the candidate hasn't completed that. But that's been very exciting for us. And part of what she has done is develop a training program for the early childhood educators to actually um, roll out the implementation of the curriculum. Um, and the area that we're working hard to develop at the moment with a, a small amount of funding we've just been able to access is the Birdies Tree Recovery Program. And that's really to help children and parents process the emotional impacts of a natural disaster, to learn cognitive behavioural and self-regulation strategies to cope with changes to family life and dynamics in a relational framework, to bring closure to the experience and integrate it into an ongoing story of family life using a narrative therapy approach, to learn to use mindfulness and body movement to build relaxation skills, and identify additional supports that may assist the child, parents and family to return to resilient functioning. At the moment, we have a number of other resources in development to support um, what we're trying to do. Um, as I said, there are new online games in development to help children understand the different types of helpers that might come and the PPE they use. Um, we have a Birdies Tree puppet play workshop that's in development with an Indigenous community in um, Northern Queensland. We have two other books that are currently being illustrated by the author that we work with. One is Fun with Birdie, which is an activity and colouring book for children to use. Um, and the other one is Relaxing with Birdie. We've had an honour student who has done mindful movement um, study with the little children in our clinical program here. And on the back of that, we've put the learnings from that into this book, which is a movement and mindfulness book to assist children with relaxation in these stressful times. And then, as I said, the um, Birdies Tree Recovery Program, we're currently working to develop manuals um, and training for that. So we have two pieces of research um, that we're conducting at the moment around this. Um, one of them is the um, evaluation of the early childhood curriculum. And there's a second piece of research um, which we're doing, which is called COVID-19 Unmasked. Um, it's uh, an online survey asking how young children aged one to five years and families are being affected by the current pandemic. Families are being asked to share their experience to help caregivers, educators and health professionals learn how to best support babies, preschoolers and families during these disruptive events. Um, it's a collaboration between our centre, the University of Queensland, Griffith University, the University of Southern Cross and the University of Melbourne. So we have, um, it's a survey of the general population with young families. And we're very much trying to, inside the survey, there are a number of um, epidemiological questions. There's um, the Promise EC, there are trauma questionnaires, there are questions about what other um, disruptive experiences and traumas families might have been exposed to, such as medical traumas, the recent um, natural disasters in Australia. 
and also developmental trauma um, and intergenerational issues. So we're trying to, in Australia, we have very little information about what's happening for children under four years. And so we're starting, wanting to try and build a picture of what that um, looks like. So at the moment, we have over 600 families that have responded, um, I think, to the whole questionnaire and we're still um, sending that out and gathering information. Um, we've got a number of people internationally who are interested in collaborating with us on that. Um, and if anyone is interested in um, distributing the survey, um, if you email birdies a hyphen tree at health.qld.gov.au, we can send you the link for that. Um, and my researcher would be very happy to kind of um, have contact from you. Similarly, if you have any other questions about the resources, we're very happy to share them. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, that was uh, excellent. And as, as a number of people have said, it's uh, really helpful to look uh, at how uh, we're approaching other disasters that uh, happen in various parts of the world. Um, and as you say, in our continent, we have um, a diversity of uh, uh, crises and disasters sort of confronting people um, as in other parts of the world. But thanks, thanks very much. Um, we've got a few questions and comments, um, and um, uh, I realise that uh, there are three seminars or webinars in this series, and uh, uh, they were billed as um, two-hour webinars, um, but uh, this one uh, uh, initiated by the uh, Mental Health Associations here and in the UK um, was uh, advertised also as an hour and a half. So there may be some people who have to leave us. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention and, and participation, but if you can stay, then I think we'll go for maybe another five minutes and then we'll finish uh, at about quarter to the hour in your country. Um, actually, I'll just kind of respond to one of the questions uh, which was actually directed to the panelists, but um, since I've got the microphone, um, uh, I reckon I can have a go at it, but it's just on away from me, except it was, uh, it was a, a question from Kazumi Ihara, from Japan and asking about the uh, potential uh, positive uh, consequences of the changes that we need to make around the world as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, for me, that was uh, quite an important uh, question because there, there are things that uh, hopefully um, uh, as a set of communities around the world, we're going to be able to respond to. There'll be an increased awareness of, um, uh, uh, increased awareness of the um, uh, effects of climate change, for example. Um, and I think there's likely to be some uh, increase in community empowerment. Um, and certainly Jane's work uh, emphasizes how disenchanted people can be with uh, non-listening bureaucracies and um, hopefully there'll be um, significant movements against them. Uh, the thoughtlessness of some of the responses and, uh, and the difficulties that we've had managing our environment. In my um, clinical work, I've found uh, that of necessity, um, telehealth can be quite uh, productive. The, some of the older kids are really very engaged with uh, telehealth um, from the mental health perspective. There are always risks and limitations. How do you manage uh, high levels of risk and the vulnerable families that the health visitors are talking about? It's a, a major um, uh, consideration. The, um, so there's a couple of slides there I could put up, uh, Gus, if I can do that. Uh, you know, I'll speak to those. It's just uh, from the Anna Freud Centre from the um, uh, Infant Mental Health Programs in uh, Michigan. There are a couple of quite useful guides on how to adapt and use um, telehealth in infant parent psychotherapy. 
And what struck me is how, um, okay, of course, Gus. Um, how we can uh, use telehealth to actually engage babies directly. I'm uh, inspired in part by my two little grandsons and how we've been using um, WhatsApp and video connection uh, to stay in touch while we weren't able to see them for two months. Um, but uh, also inspired by the families that I've been working with where you can engage a baby over the telephone sorry, over the phone if you're using WhatsApp. And uh, lots of people do have phones. And in Africa, uh, India, um, the phone may be a much more powerful means of uh, uh, reaching people and intervention than, than we may think. Um, so, uh, yeah, Kazumi, that's a really important question. Fathers, um, because of lockdown, spending two months uh, intensive time with their babies, which they might not otherwise have experienced. And I've certainly um, spoken to a number of uh, fathers through my work at the hospital who said that they've discovered something about their baby that they wouldn't have had. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, positives may come out of it. A lot of um, tragedy and death, however, um, and uh, we need to, again, keep thinking of creating creative ways to help infants and young children um, uh, understand what's happened to their grandparents or the neighbour or their auntie or their uncle or the person who's died. Um, uh, that's going to be a big issue in, in many countries. The other two questions, um, Alice Hugh in Melbourne was asking about the, uh, whether Sally's approach to uh, policy change and uh, lobbying uh, is something that we can use and adapt here in, in our in our country, and uh, uh, I don't know whether Sally uh, would like to add any more to that. We've got a Royal Commission into Mental Health Reform. Um, what's a, a good tip, <laughs> uh, asks Alice, in uh, influencing such a thing as the Royal Commission into the reform of mental health services? Yeah, so I, I, um, I typed up a few answers. I think the three oh, things yeah. occurred to me, um, I think one is around really trying to reflect the language that your government and your policymakers use kind of back at them. So we might talk about infant mental health or attachment, but what do they talk about? How do they, how do they frame this? Is, is it about um, early intervention? Is it about school readiness? Is it about um, emotional well-being and development? Trying to kind of make sure that we're talking the same language is one of them. The second one is just really pulling together. There's so much evidence about the importance of infant mental health. So really pulling together those compelling facts and stats that are going to convince policymakers that whatever their priorities are at the moment, we can show a link between infant mental health and those things. And the third one is about bringing that broad church of people together. We're, we're always better if we do things together and we speak with a united voice. But also I think one of the real lessons from the, the positive campaigning on maternal mental health in the UK is that the value of getting people who haven't got a direct interest in services to campaign. So if a perinatal psychologist or psychiatrist says we need more people like me, everyone will go, well, of course you'd say that, wouldn't you? If a health visitor or a head teacher or you know, somebody else who hasn't got that same direct interest is also saying that together, then it's so much more powerful. So I think finding those kind of other champions in kind of wider public services and wider society you can say yeah what they're doing is really important and i care about it too is so important so i think those were my three top tips thanks very much Sally. um uh the next question was from uh, nancy little in scotland who was asking where parents would get advice uh in terms of um children returning to school child care when to go back to work um, and I guess that's going to be something that's very localised or regional. I don't know whether it's, uh, you could ask the Prime Minister, but you might get a mixed message um, in, in the UK um, from your Prime Minister. Maybe there are local informed uh, chief medical officers and chief nursing officers who might have a more informed and uh, scientific response. Uh, I shouldn't be speaking for the UK. Any comments, Sally? Dave? 
Um, I mean, I think, so um, I said in my presentation that the Thursday and One Days movement doesn't kind of speak directly to parents, but many of the members do, and some of our member organisations, the local teams and the national organisations, people like Anna Freud Centre and others, Ha, um, have been doing some wonderful stuff talking directly to parents and helping inform those decisions. So there's, there's some wonderful stuff out there, just as Elizabeth was talking about the fab stuff that, that, that's coming out of Australia. Um, I think, you know, the more we can signpost parents to that. But in terms of the specific decisions about, I guess, what government is allowing families to do, then, yeah, I mean, the government advice is there, but it's, it's patchy and inconsistent in the UK. Um, and particularly the childcare stuff, there was a message that all children, could, all preschoolers, anybody could go back to childcare. But the specific advice for professionals was very focused on the older children. So, um, so yeah, but, but our members are doing some fab fabulous stuff to help parents navigate those difficult decisions. Would any of the other panellists, uh, presenters, like to make a comment or question? Um, maybe I'll just get back to my uh, last slide and, um, uh, and then perhaps um, uh, take an opportunity to thank everyone um, uh, and maybe introduce uh, Nicole Milburn. I'm not sure whether you're able to appear uh, with us, Nicole, or not. Uh, Nicole Milburn is a clinical psychologist and uh, been very involved in developing uh, some very innovative and intensive uh, programs for very vulnerable infants and families here in Victoria. And uh, uh, Nicole did uh, uh, a whole um, lot of the legwork organising uh, this um, uh, um, webinar for us tonight. So thanks very much, Nicole. And uh, uh, maybe I can finish with, uh, uh, I guess, uh, building on some of the comments, particularly from um, uh, uh, Kuzumi, who and what, where can this take us? Um, and I, I think there are many challenges, but there are some opportunities for us for infant mental health to uh, seize the, the day, as it were, and uh, build on material from each of the presenters today. And behind that, we've got the notion that uh, humans have a great capacity for responding to crises with creativity and humanity and positive change. But this needs leadership and, uh, and it needs uh, scholarship and it needs uh, creativity. And I think the three presenters tonight have given us the concept of um, leadership, um, Jane, the importance of scholarship and um, having some data to prove what we're uh, pushing, what we're wanting to do. And um, uh, Elizabeth, the creativity that comes from uh, children, engaging children in the media that, uh, that relate to them uh, and all of these lead to ways of building um, a change that's positive for us. As Colin Trevathan said, the human neonate has neurobiological preparedness to participate and share meanings with others with coherent, rhythmic, purposeful consciousness. Babies are born with motives and emotions for action that sustain human sustainability. So we should take our lead from the baby and I think our task is to facilitate the circumstances um, that lead to the baby and the parent safely getting to know each other right from the beginning in all circumstances, in all um, uh, difficult and uh, in all supportive circumstances. So maybe uh, at that point I might again thank each of the presenters um, and thank everyone who's participated. We've had around 135 people uh, join us tonight and uh, maybe look forward to some of you coming uh, today, uh, coming tomorrow and uh, next week for the, this series of webinars. And we hope to, oh, next slide. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we hope to use the webinars as a way of keeping in touch um, until we meet uh, in person in Brisbane next year at the end of June, um, where, as I mentioned before, the opportunity for social distancing is great. You'll be able to be hundreds of miles from another person uh, with a short drive outside Brisbane. Um, and within Brisbane, it'll be uh, safe and uh, secure inside the, the convention centre. So, um, well, and I think uh, Gus is going to put up some information 
uh, about the next webinar if I stop talking. Um, except the last thing I want to say is, is thank uh, Gus Fraser from uh, Melbourne University, who's been um, uh, cleverly um, supporting and managing us behind the scenes there. So thanks very much, Gus. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to everyone for participating. Campbell, I and think Nicole is, actually, Nicole is actually available if you'd like to. Okay, um, yeah. Thanks, Campbell. Can, here I am. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, again, um, thank everybody. Thanks, everyone on the panel. Thank you for persevering with all of the um, arrangements that we've been making across all these different time zones. It's been a real... Uh, a real effort and thanks everyone for their patience. Um, I think um, this has been a great event for Infant Mental Health Week and I really hope that tonight that we've seen the beginning of something that we could do again um, in years to come as we all come together, you know, not not in person in Brisbane, sadly, partly because it's, um, it's always lovely to get together uh, for a way in Congress and um, it's warmer in Brisbane than it is in Melbourne, just saying. Um, but we can come together in lots of different ways and I think that's been the great um, learning that we've all had out of the pandemic. So uh, thank you again. Congratulations, Campbell, on being newly elected, elected Wayne president. And thank you especially to the subcommittee of AIM for yeah. doing all the hard Absolutely. work behind the scenes and um, the partnership with the Parent Infant Foundation and AIM UK and WAME. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks very much, Nicole. Thank Good, you. Goodbye, everyone. Enjoy the day. Keep well. Keep safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gus.